<laughs> Hi there, and welcome to Untold Developer Stories, where we talk to popular developers and get the scoop on stories you didn't know. I'm Agat Badia, junior developer and podcast host at Honeypod for Untold Developer Stories. I'm Hannah Auger, content person and writer. And in Today's episode, we're very, very happy to have Katalin Pitt, a journey through software engineering, technical writing, um, but also through social media, content creation. So yeah, thank you so much for being with us today, Katalin. Hey, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's my pleasure and I'm really honored to be here. So thank you once again. I mean, you have the setup for it. It looks sweet. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, we're we're definitely honored to also learn a lot from you as well and I also wonder because you you started in software engineering you also did uh, you're also all doing technical writing so I was I was wondering what was the path that led you first into computer science but also what uh, what did you see in uh, in technical writing to say oh this is my next uh, my next goal. I didn't want to become a developer since forever. Actually, I was studying um, accountancy. I was on track to become an accountant or a bank teller, something like that. But in the summer of 2013, I went uh, to in a holiday to my father in UK, and before leaving to come back home, we just asked ourselves, "What if we give it a shot and try to live here for a while?" And when I went to, um, how do I say, to sign up for schools, they they all told me at high school that I'm too old to enroll in a high school. And the only route is college, which is not the same in UK as in USA. A college is not the university. It's, I think, like high school. I'm not really sure. So there I had to choose between different paths, like, I don't know, becoming a carpenter, IT, plumber, something like that. And since I already, since I liked computers since forever and I had a bit of um, experience with computers, I chose IT, but I didn't think of programming or something like that. For three years, I did very basic stuff, which was not even related to programming, Microsoft Word, stuff like that. And after college, I could only go to study computer science. I couldn't go to study medicine, for example. So I had to go on the same route. And yeah, I applied to study a computer science degree, which I did and completed after three years. And then the hardest part came. I had to apply for jobs and hopefully get a job. Um, and as you know, it's super difficult to get one. There's a lot of competition and so on. So I was solving lead code problems and all kinds of problems they usually ask in interviews. And I said, why not put them publicly? So maybe it helps other people. But first of all, it helps me because I explained my solutions as I would do in an interview setting, almost like an interview setting. And I can always come back to them and improve them. And like I said, maybe it helps others. So for one year, I only did that. I opened the blog and I wrote, I wrote about my solutions to coding problems, which eventually uh, got quite popular. And then I discovered my passion for tech writing. But before going on, I, I want to say that writing is something that I enjoy the most most than creating um, video content and so on. I had blogs since I was uh, 14 years old, but not, mm. not tech blogs, all kinds of blogs. So technical writing is something I enjoy the most and something that I want to do uh, all for my whole life. So I hope I wasn't too long with this introduction, <laughs> but I wanted to start from the beginning uh, to how I got here with technical writing and tech. So you actually got this technical writing in, in you even before you realized that you were doing technical writing. So it's like something that just grew uh, little by little. And then you realized that it can be a whole job uh, in itself, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. It is, I mean, it is a whole job in itself. Like technical writing, 
I'm a writer and technical writing is still a completely different world. Like that's an entirely different skill set that you've just like put into everything else. Yeah. It, it's nice. I really enjoyed it. And this, I don't know how it's called in uh, in high schools in USA or in UK or other countries, but in Romania, when we studied the Romanian language, we had um, a module where you write a lot. And that was my favorite subject, like writing stories and stuff like that. That's not what I would expect to hear from a developer. It's kind of funny. <laughs> but I, if I, if I can divert us for a second, it's sure. really interesting that you mentioned liking blogging so much and writing so much. And I know a few times you've mentioned that the YouTube videos and being in the public eye, that kind of helped you get over being shy. Do you think that's why you prefer writing? Uh, no, I, I just really like writing. Uh, it flows out of me if it makes sense. And I still uh, put those articles publicly. So I'm still in front of people. I can still get criticized and stuff like that. So I don't do it that way, opposed to YouTube. I, I just love it. So I, I love writing everything I learn. And I even want to open uh, a personal blog, for example, about soft skills in tech and all kinds of stuff. That's awesome. And so as you for you, it, it became quite natural to to write for 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 yourself and also, as you said, to share. Um, and I guess you probably have a lot of people who are interested into starting uh, technical writing. What would you uh, recommend them to do to put the foot into technical writing? First of all, there is a course from Google for technical writing technical writers it's super basic and useful uh, I'll see how can I link it I, I uh, really recommend that and I for developers I recommend choosing a blogging platform so they can only focus on their writing and also I recommend getting their own domain as the first steps after that the after that I in, I advise people to focus on quality rather than quantity. I would say it's better to put out one article every two weeks that that's uh, good than putting like 10 articles per week. But that doesn't mean you have to obsess over perfection. Make it sure it's good, but don't obsess over it and respect the, I don't know, the basic writing um, tips, have headings, um, don't make assumption. If you make any assumption or you assume everything, back it up with facts. Uh, what else include? If you write about building applications, include the source code, include uh, code snippets, snippets, and don't do it as images. I don't know if you've <laughs> ever seen, but some people put uh, images, which excludes uh, blind people or visually impaired people. And yeah, these are my basic tips. Awesome. You say Thank basic you. Tips, but those are also like very, very handy tips. I think a lot of good writing and success through blogging is just adhering to those tips and making good content. Like there's not really a shortcut, I don't think. Yeah, there isn't. My my first uh, blog articles were horrendous. They were super bad. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how you improve is a practical uh, skill. So you have to write a lot to get better is the same with coding. So there's nothing to be ashamed of. We all start from somewhere. Uh, you'll improve a lot over time. So don't be afraid to start. You can always come back and improve those articles. That's awesome. And yeah, practice makes perfect. Yeah. And I guess that's a great exercise also as a, de as a developer, because it's you, you could relate to technical writing as a dev. That's awesome. For you. And, and I also wondered because Technical writing, my understanding is that it's also, um, how do I say, uh, maybe some something extra that a developer can do, or if they want to, let's say, uh, bring back to the community with sharing their learnings and as you are doing. But you also do that more as a as a full time technical writer. So I wondered what could, how does uh, the day of a technical writer uh, look like? So I usually write articles or do intensive work before uh, my work, 
this didn't make uh, much sense. So let me rephrase it. <laughs> I, I, I wake up earlier before I do the work for my employer. So for example, if I start working at, a, at 8 a.m., I wake up at 6, 6.30 or something like that. I quickly write an article, even if it's not perfect because I'm not publishing, publishing it straight away. I want to have at least a, a rough version. And after work, I go over it and I try to improve it. But I also want to emphasize that it's really intensive and it takes a lot of time. So I don't do this every single day. I do it like maybe one or twice per week. Uh, otherwise, I burn out. So it's it's not really interesting or some groundbreaking tips. I just write the article before work and after work, I go over it, try to improve it. Then I leave it for a day and I come back the next day to come with a fresh perspective and go over it again. And also in weekends, when I have time, uh, I just write articles or polish the ones I written over the week. That sounds exhausting. <laughs> Yeah, it is. <laughs> like it really is that, exhausting. That, that's why I don't want to encourage people to do this mm -hmm. every day. And I wanted to mention that I don't do it uh, all the time because it's not sustainable and I don't uh, live to work. I work to live. So yeah, balance is key. Yeah, it's interesting you say that also because like it's work, but also it's something you enjoy. So it's blurring that line. And I think a lot of developers, it blurs, everything blurs the line of like this is work and this is play. Like if you do any kind of side project, it's kind of both. And you can very quickly just spend all of your time working. And even if it's fun, you're still gonna get burnt out in the end, I assume. Yeah, yes, of course. And uh, I have bad experience with this because I tend to overwork myself. Like you said, is a very uh, easy line to cross. So you can go you can easily go from, I don't know, doing a, a bit on your free time to overworking yourself and burning out yourself. So this is something I learn myself and I try to avoid in the future. But yeah, writing doesn't really feel like work for me, but sometimes it can be. I don't want to lie and say it's all fun and games. Yeah. I mean, anything that starts out fun at some point, it still gets to be tiring, no matter how much you love it, it still is going to end up taking energy. Yeah. And I know you talked quite a bit about um, burnout and I believe you had to quit your last job or you chose to quit your last job because of burnout. Um, can you tell us a bit about like how that transpired? What was that like? So for example, all was good. I joined that job. I really like it. I enjoyed it. Um, and it was a bit above my weight. I, I mean, I had to catch up and learn things. So I spent a lot of time before work and after work, uh, learning new stuff, building applications. And the worst thing of all is that I'm working when I'm not working. And what I mean by that is that once I stop uh, working and I go out of the office, I keep thinking, I need to learn that, I need to do that, uh, I didn't do that. So my brain is constantly stressed and thinking. and I did this for six months or so, and by by the end of it, I was just exhausted and my at my lowest point ever. They offered to help me and stuff like that, but I just couldn't continue. I had to take uh, one month and a half or two to slightly recover because I'm still recovering. So yeah, that's that's how it happened because I put too much stress on myself to mm -hmm. catch up, learn new things, and I didn't uh, relax enough. Do you actually feel in the tech industry that unfortunately burnouts or in general mental health is something that is quite either not transparent enough or that burnouts are actually more, more common among developers? Uh, I don't have a definitive opinion, but I've seen many developers burn out. And then we can go back to what we discussed earlier. It's a very uh, easy to cross from learning a thing or two in your free time to overworking yourself. And also, 
if you look on social media and i'm guilty of this uh, you always see people uh, hard work is the only way to success uh, code for 24 hours each day and stuff like that and i wasn't aware of that and i even said that as well in the beginning so pe beginners like myself uh, you form the wrong idea you you have the idea that you have to work non-stop you have to learn non-stop otherwise you become obsolete and stuff like that mm -hmm. i was guilty of following those advices and giving those advices so now I try to recover from that and to bring more transparency and to show that that is not the only way or even the right way. And coming back to your question, yeah, I think burnout is uh, more prevalent in software engineers because of that. Or maybe it's just because I work in this industry and I see it more often. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'd be really curious to see like personalities, like if someone could chart out the different personalities of different sorts of roles and see if software developers are just more inclined to behave a certain way, or if it's like the nature of the work, because what you're doing is constantly problem solving. That's basically what you're doing. Um, like it's, it's constantly having to rack your brain and answer these questions. And I wonder if that just makes it, you know, easier to, to, to not turn it off and just keep going. <laughs> Yeah, maybe, because this is the funny thing. When I worked in construction, after um, I went home, I didn't start building buildings and stuff like that in my own time. I just enjoyed my free time and I <laughs> I spent time doing stuff I like. Uh, I didn't have to worry about not being able to get a job if I don't learn 10,000 things in my afternoon. And the same when I worked in a restaurant. When the work is done, I just went home and relaxed go back to the work refreshed um, the next day. But I have a bad relationship with tech because I always feel the need to learn stuff uh, mm -hmm. and now to create stuff because I write. So, yeah. There is this fine line between your hobby when you say, oh, today I'm going to code on my side project. Yeah. And I think everyone can relate to that versus, yeah, my week, not my normal week where I work on, uh, on the business uh, problem solving part. And I guess this, as you said, this can be the fine line that is difficult to, to, to balance between your mental health and also how you, how you see yourself as a, as a developer. Do you, as you're also, uh, I, I never know how to call it, like as you're also tech personalities on, on Twitter, you also have, yeah, as you said earlier, your own YouTube channel. Um, how do you think, um, like as, as you probably have read and also have shared with your experience, how do you think we can uh, prevent and also spread awareness uh, about mental health in, in tech? First of all, I think it would help if more people would speak about and especially people that are well known in the tech space. For example, in my case, uh, I can be transparent about it because I don't know uh, because I don't care what some anonymous user will say about me in the comments. So I don't really care and I can be transparent about it. But many people care about the opinion of others. So that's a big roadblock in making it more transparent. But I think we should all start from ourselves. For example, if I struggle with something like burnout, uh, I'll talk about it. And if the next person does that as well, then we can bring more awareness and people can see uh, the real face of tech. I mean, it's not all uh, fun and games. It's not, uh, I don't know, the, the best job ever. I'm not saying it's yeah. bad, but like everything has positives and negatives. Of course. Yeah, so. It's not just foosball and soda all the time. Sometimes it gets difficult. Yes, yes. And I can say, maybe it's weird, but uh, programming for me, it's harder than when I worked in construction and I had to uh, work physically. And I also feel like working physically, I can overwork myself and and I don't feel the reper reper repercussions. But if I overwork myself with programming, I'm just like, I don't know, uh, I feel super bad mentally and physically so 
Yeah, I, I know when I, I'm not a programmer, but I know like when I use my brain that much and I'm really that focused, it just, everything just hurts. And I think it's also because you're doing something mm -hmm. that you probably love or that you, you know, you value a little bit more than mm -hmm. if you're putting bricks on top of other bricks. Like this is something that, I mean, you have a YouTube channel and all sorts of Twitter followers and things. So it's probably very valuable to you. So it really personally matters if, you know, you can make a difference. I, I assume that plays into it for a lot of developers. Yeah, that's true. And that's one of the things that pushes myself to overwork myself. So I'm still learning how to balance everything. I mean, you you have been contributing to, to a lot of things. I Also, on, on your YouTube channel, you have especially a video uh, sharing your own experience with, um, yeah, the, the moment you had this this burnout, which was, uh, I, felt, I felt a bit emotional as well, because you really have this very... Um, genuine way of describing it and I think I mean my own impression as a junior dev was wow thank you for sharing and probably the the other thousand people who watched this video probably had the same uh feeling as well to as you said spread this this awareness so that's really nice to see from someone who has this experience thank you very much yeah I, I always try to be myself there is no point in trying to be someone else like I said I don't care about uh, comments from strangers and and at the same time I'm not looking for uh, for pity from the same people I just put it out there because maybe it might help other people and if not I just vent myself so have you always had that thick skin because I know when I put anything out there I I would be very <laughs> upset if someone says something mean uh, no, and this is something I posted on Twitter, I don't know, this year or last year, that since I started Twitter, uh, mean comments rarely get to me. And now I just put my stuff out. Uh, if I get mean comments without constructive uh, feedback, like mm -hmm. really mean and only going after myself, uh, what, can I, what can I say? What can I do to that person to change uh, their opinion is probably they have some issues in their personal lives and they take it mm -hmm. out on the internet or I don't know, because when somebody leaves a mean comment and I I leave a nice reply, like, thank you for your comment or something like that, they apologize and say that maybe they were too harsh and they didn't mean it. And mm -hmm. of course, it's not always the case, but sometimes people go through bad things in their life and without realizing they i don't know they take their frustrations online so now yeah. i try to not take it personally but that doesn't mean uh, I, i'm immune to everything sometimes i get uh, bad comments and i just want to give up everything altogether mm -hmm. but most of the times i really don't care like i said if it's really negative with no constructive criticism that's a super, um, like super healthy approach, I think, in general, <laughs> because also everyone is just kind of doing their best on a daily basis. And half of us, or most of us are probably like a mess most of the time anyway. Um, <laughs> we're just trying to do things correctly. So like having that empathy for everyone else, I guess, inside of work and outside of work can, I don't know if it affects your actual development itself, like, like at the computer, but I'm sure it makes all of your work you know, writing and making videos and giving back to the community, it makes it probably a lot easier. Yeah, I can say that uh, the only pressure I put on myself is releasing content and sometimes about the reach and views of them. But other than that, it's, uh, it, I enjoy it. You just release it. You're like, I made this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and whenever I press that publish button, it, it's a great feeling. It's a great feeling every time I manage to put something out. Mm -hmm. Actually, you kind of brought me back to something that we talked about before the last time we talked. I asked you um, like, what you had learned from being in the public eye so much. And you said something to the extent of um, like 1% of what you've learned on social media was technical fact, practical things, and 99% was social. And that seems to be a really big theme. And I know you mentioned in that same conversation that like when you first came onto social media, you weren't necessarily ready for that environment. You weren't ready for so many different kinds of cultures and backgrounds. Um, can you maybe walk us through what 
that trajectory has been like of landing on Twitter and like being yourself and then kind of learning how to, to, to change a little bit? Yeah, so when I started on social media, I was like all over the place. Uh, what whatever went through my head, uh, whatever went through my head, I published it. Sometimes they were really bad takes. Sometimes uh, they were good but uh, worded improperly. Improperly, I don't know what's the word. And yeah, since I've been on Twitter, I can safely say that I learned one percent or less tech stuff. I really don't use it for that, but I learned how to behave uh, properly. I learned about things which I wasn't aware of. Like I said, I come I come from an Eastern European country. Here, things are super different compared to USA or other advanced countries. Some things which are considered inappropriate in USA or countries like that it still is in Eastern European countries, but people are not really aware of. And yeah, I had some really bad takes, which were which wouldn't cause me any problems in these countries, but people who are more advanced uh, found them offensive and they were. And I learned a lot of stuff around this topic about, how can I say? I learned how to consider other people's opinions. I learned that, that there is more in this life than myself. I learned about, uh, for example, I, I, I will be honest, I never heard about white privileges until being on Twitter. So I wasn't aware at all about this stuff. And these are the things I learned. And these are the things that I take with myself, even if tomorrow there is no Twitter or mm -hmm. if I don't have any social media. These are the most valuable lessons. Did that also trigger this interest to also write about soft skills later on? Uh, no, I, I always liked about talking about these things because You can find 10,000 articles about technical topics, but not many people share their journeys or what, I don't know, about how to prepare for an interview, but like genuine, not uh, mm -hmm. trying to sell you uh, an interview <laughs> tool or something like that. Yeah. Uh, how to manage burnout. Again, something genuine coming from someone who had it, not like, 10 tips how to prevent burnout and is full of basic uh, tips. Yeah. So not many people share it and it's something I would have liked and I would still like to read from other people. Mm -hmm. So I try to do that on my part, share what I know, what I did and work, and hopefully it helps others as well. This is awesome. Because yeah, as you said, originally it was about writing and then you kind of arrived on on YouTube, which is the, the actually the, the video podcast version of also sharing your experience. Um, what was the original reason uh, to start on YouTube? Okay, the original reason for starting on YouTube was to become <laughs> less awkward in front of the camera and to become more comfortable speaking in front of the people. I always dislike my voice and my English. I still dislike my English. I come, I've come to terms with my, uh, with my voice. And yeah, that's why I did it. And that's why I still do it because mm -hmm. I, I still, I'm still not comfortable. It takes me years to make one video. So, but it's still, but at least I'm more comfortable speaking in front of the camera. Uh, I don't feel Uh, that nervous or nervous at all anymore. Um, I, I don't worry that much about my English. Uh, looking back at my old videos, which people cannot see because they are private, I can see how much I improved. So mm -hmm. the journey with YouTube is half away complete because I achieved what I proposed. Now whatever comes mm -hmm. is a bonus. That's so cool. <laughs> no, dear. <laughs> no, we have to say different things. That's, I love the, 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 the idea that it would also help you practice your English because I am a native English speaker. So I hear people say this quite a lot. And it's really, it, 
it's upsetting to me because I don't want people to feel uncomfortable speaking English because I feel uncomfortable speaking other languages. And it's just, you know, it's really hard as an adult to learn another language. Like I live in Germany and my German's fine, but if I held myself to the same level that non-native English speakers hold themselves to, I would be stressed all the time. Yeah, in my case, for some reason, uh, I don't think I'll ever be able to speak English like fluently, but it's fine. For example, I had a friend in UK and after one year he spoke English like he was mm -hmm. born there. That's not my case, sadly, <laughs> so I have to... I have to work harder and this is one of the things uh, this is one of the reasons why I started the YouTube channel. It obviously improved but yeah, I have a long uh, I still have a long way to go. I think it is it's a lot harder I think for some languages than from others. Like if there's any similarities it's a lot easier to jump, but if they're very dissimilar it's like <laughs> Yeah, and I have a hard time pronouncing words, so this, for example, on the opposite, I like writing in English and mm -hmm. I consider myself quite okay. Not the best, not the worst. That was always my best part. And my verbal English was <laughs> my bad part. I understand the struggle. <laughs> German. <laughs> so you have this, this technical writing and this this kind of challenge you put yourself through through YouTube and being comfortable. Um, do you have like it, it feels like you're you're putting always super cool challenge uh, for yourself? What what is your next challenge in terms of either mm -hmm. for work or contributing back to the community? Uh, putting aside all those goals, I don't want to be a hypocrite or something like <laughs> that. I like to make money. Who doesn't? So. Yeah. <laughs> I also want to make money with them. Uh, with YouTube, obviously, I don't make any money. It's uh, it's quite new, and I'm not even looking to do in the uh, in the future. I still have a long way to go. With my blog, the same. My blog is like my personal space where I dump my brain. But on the other hand, I make money with technical writing, and and at times I can even match my salary from writing in my free time. So I'm not going to come here and say, I only want to help. I don't care about anything because I love helping. But at the same time, I still have to buy food for me and my family. So my next goals are to, I'm actively working on my blog to improve the SEO and everything so I can make some passive income. And of course, I would like to make money with the YouTube as well, but who knows what the future holds. Mm -hmm. If I make any money with YouTube, good. If not, <laughs> good oh, as well. <laughs> that's also important. Like at the end, mm -hmm. it's it started as a job and then there are additional things that you, you do for yourself that also can make revenue, which is makes total sense. <laughs> yeah. And we all need to feed our family. So I'm not ashamed mm -hmm. of wanting to make money. Yeah. I Yeah. It's weird. I think... It's very easy for developers to to want to have all these side projects. And I think like open source, that's a good example. You don't make money on open source. You, you're giving back to the community. And there's such an, F, like, an emphasis on giving back to the community. But it's also totally fine to want to make money. <laughs> From for, for the people that are also um, listening to your path, to your experience, and also to, to making, yeah, basically making money out of your uh, content creation, um, from what you learned, the, I guess the, the good and the not so good, what would you recommend for um, people who want to start um, earning money and into either technical writing or content creation in general? Maybe the, the do's and don'ts. Okay, I cannot advise people um, how to make money from content creation per se, like uh, your personal blogs and YouTube, because I, like I said, I don't make money with them. Maybe I can make money with my blog by adding uh, ads from companies, putting their banners and stuff like that, but I don't. But on the other hand, I can speak about technical writing. So you don't need to have... Uh, any amount of followers or you don't know you don't need to be i don't know who to make articles and to get paid for them mm -hmm. oh open a blog this is my advice and i also have an article about this on my blog 
uh, it's not a universal pet or the only pet, but this is my advice and what worked for me. It's always important to keep in mind that what worked for some might not work for you, but still. So open a blog. Uh, I advise using a blogging platform so so you don't spend more time on fixing and building your blog rather than writing. Publish a handful of articles to get comfortable. Try to improve from article to article. I cannot say how many articles to write before applying to write for someone because it depends. You might you might do it even from the start. It depends um, how good you are with technical writing. And after that, apply to write for publications like Free Code Camp or Hacker Known. And the reason I'm advising this is because they have an editing team or editor team. I don't know how it's called. They check your article your articles and they only get published if they are of good quality so this is your chance to have people professional people check your work for free and provide you feedback so this i can is make a, a suggestion also so, sorry you can also submit your articles to honeypot we will also look at your articles and give you tips okay another one <laughs> sorry <laughs> yeah, i would so, get slapped if i didn't say something it's fine so yeah, this is a great way of honing your skills for free. And also the nice thing about these three platforms is that you can get your articles in front of hundreds of thousands of people. So you can help as many as possible. And lastly, there are a lot of websites like Honeypot, for example, which pay, I don't know if you pay actually for articles. Oh, yes. so, okay. <laughs> which pay for articles. So they don't care about your followers count, uh, who you are, what you do, as long as you provide a good article, a good technical article uh, with, I don't know, with great content. I made a list on my blog with publications that pay to write, that pay you to write articles for them. But if you Google, you can find uh, any of them. I don't want to give names on this podcast because there are many and I don't want to single out some. So to summarize, open a blog, hone your skills, try to write some articles, apply to write for publications like Honeypot, Free Code Camp, Hacker Noon that edits your article and help you hone your skills for free. And then apply to write paid articles. You can basically almost any companies that any company that have a, I don't know, a, a software or something are looking for content. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you search on Google, you might even stumble over my article, which is a table with some publications that pay you to write for them. And like I said, it's not the only pet. For example, you can submit your article straight away to those publications if you are comfortable and confident in your skills. And I want to mention something because people might have the idea that because I have 60K followers, people are pouring in my DMs asking me to write for them and worshiping me, but that's not the case. Nobody cares. Just do it. You don't even need to have a social media account for that matter. So don't be put off by those things. Yeah, those are really useful tips. A lot of getting started is just getting started and just starting to write and be like, will you publish me maybe? <laughs> Yeah. Yes no. <laughs> yeah, and the more you publish, the more people find your articles mm -hmm. and then they will start contacting you. So like with anything, the beginning is the hardest. We are unfortunately starting to approach the end of uh, our podcast, but um before um starting our conclusion, um well, Obviously, on Twitter, I was wondering, like, where can we reach out to you? But definitely on Twitter through Catalan Pit. Where else can we find you and the audience contact you to continue the conversation? So I have a Linktree account, which has all my social media platforms. I'm on Instagram, on LinkedIn, uh, and, I, and on Facebook. But I only use, I use mostly Twitter and LinkedIn and sometimes on Instagram and Facebook. But yeah, we can connect anywhere you want, anywhere you feel comfortable. What was the Twitter account again? Just so it's super clear. My Twitter account, mm -hmm. it's Kathleen M. Pitt. So C-A-T 
A L I N M Pit. So Catalin M Pit. <laughs> As you're spelling it out on my head, I was also like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I was I was also nervous not to make a mistake because <laughs> uh, last week I tried to spell something um, in the stand up and I got it wrong like five times. <laughs> That's the worst. It happens to the best. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'll hide behind the fact that I'm not a native speaker. So. Yeah, do that. Do that as much as you can. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing your experience and being very genuinely, genuinely honest with, um, with, with your journey so far. Uh, that's been super, super insightful. Do you have maybe one last piece of advice for the persons who would like to follow your path? I don't know if I have an advice for people who want to follow my path, but I have an advice for everyone that wants to become a developer uh, and it might be cliche but anyways treat it like a marathon not like a sprint and i say this because one of my biggest mistakes was trying to cram and learn everything in, in i don't know in one month like the world was finishing uh, there is a lot of time to learn stuff so take it easily put uh, focus on a healthy balance between life and work and and what else and you'll have a long career well then thanks a lot everyone and don't forget to check out Catalin's pit uh, youtube channel he is on twitter with Catalin pit um i won't do the Catalin spelling if I'm on twitter Catalin and pit thank you <laughs> the other i still have an account but i don't know the password to it so it's still my account but there is no activity. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So don't forget the M. Don't yeah. forget the M. Also, thank you very much. And see you then in the next episode of Untold Developer Stories. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. of developers find jobs across Europe using Honeypot. If you're up for a new challenge in one of these European cities, sign up at honeypot.io. If you want to see more tech documentaries, then subscribe so you don't miss the next one.